Hi, my name is Christina. I'm a third year student at Bunko Fashion College in Tokyo. And today I'm going to talk to you guys about my first year in Japan. So I arrived in Japan on January 1st, 2011, on New Year's Day. I had been to Japan a few times before <laughs> with family, but it was obviously really different to actually move here. So I mean, I had more luggage, I had more everything. Even though I had a, a dorm set up for myself, it wasn't quite ready for me the day I arrived. So I had to stay in a hotel for a little bit before I could officially move in. The big difference between coming for like fun for like a trip and like coming here to move is that there's actually a lot more processes that you have to go through. Get like a bank account. Well, you don't have to get a bank account, but it's a really good idea if you're going to be here for a long time. You need to get a, a phone, you need to get all these kinds of things that like you kind of forget about when you are living in your country and you already have these things. So all of these things have to be done kind of at once, so it's kind of overwhelming. So one of the first things you have to do when you arrive to Japan to live here is that you have to go to your local government office and you have to register for your alien registration card, which is pretty much your legal ID in Japan which you have to carry on you at all times. And it just, it shows, it proves that you have the right to live here. Once you have your card, you can get your bank account, you can get a phone contract, you can get an apartment contract, you can do a lot more things. And it's, it's legally required of you to have it. Most foreigners just call their alien registration card a gaijin card because gaijin means foreigner in Japanese. So um, if you find any like websites or anything that says that you need a gaijin card, it's the exact same thing as an alien, alien registration card. When I had moved here, again, it was over three years ago, it was the old system of gaijin cards. So I had to go and get it done myself. I've heard that it's slightly different now, but that um, I can't tell you from experience because I, I didn't have to do it. If it's different from what I explained, I'm really sorry. So I got my card, I got my phone, I got my, um, my bank account, I got all those kinds of like annoying things out of the way. And then uh, I was ready to start my first year of living here. I got here early before my classes started, which allowed me to kind of get these kinds of things done out, out of the way ahead of time. So my first year in Japan was uh, spent at a language school to improve my Japanese. The big difference between going to a language school versus like going to school in your own country is that it's a very different environment because it's basically, I don't know, you and a bunch of other foreigners trying to learn how to speak to each other, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. And especially depending on the level that you start off with, if you're starting off at a very basic level, like a first level or a second level or something like that, it's pretty much a bunch of like 20 year olds trying to say things like, I like walking in the park. It really makes you appreciate more your own mother tongue and the ability to, to speak freely amongst people because um, all of a sudden you're kind of not in that um, environment anymore. So you have to kind of think of interesting ways of saying the exact same thing you want to say. I mean, it's, it's challenging, but it's fun. When you first come to Japan, you, you might think that it'll be really easy to make friends with all kinds of Japanese people. But the reality of the situation is that if you're going to a language school, um, all of your classmates are going to be other foreigners. So it might not be as easy as you might expect to meet Japanese friends. I was in the same kind of situation. I was like, you know, I've been here for a couple months. Most of my friends are foreigners. What am I doing wrong? And I wasn't doing anything wrong. I just wasn't, I guess, putting myself out there as much as I should have been. I did some Google searches. I found like, um, like an international kind of circle or, well, we call them circles in Japan, but like a club, an international club actually at uh, Tokyo University that was open to all kinds of people, so not just students from that school. It was just a bunch of people, both Japanese and foreign, who were interested in learning more about kind of each other and each other's cultures. That was kind of like my first time meeting friends, like at least kind of in my age range. Kids who are going to university as well, so in their early 20s or whatever. I was able to make friends. It was in a really good environment as well. Things like international parties you can go to. There are things like singles, international singles parties. There's all kinds of things that you can go to to, to meet people. But depending on how old you are and like what you're looking for, some things may or may not be appropriate. And if you're looking for just making friends, things like kind of clubs or things for university students are probably the best things for you. So another thing that I've, I've heard of, I've never done it myself, so I can't really tell you um, how it's like, but I've heard that some like ward offices, so like it's kind of like your local government uh, center, will um, offer like Japanese practice conversation class things, I think for free as well. I don't know if it's really necessarily the opportunity to make friends per se, but at the very least you'd be able to practice your Japanese a little bit more uh, without actual Japanese people. What I really relied on personally to make friends is I got out of my house, which sounds like a really simple thing, but like every day 
I leave my house no matter how the weather is no matter how I feel like so unless I'm like really sick but even then like since moving to Japan in, in over three years I think I spent two or three days where I never didn't leave my house every day you go out of your house you go to stores you don't have to buy anything but go to stores go out talk to people and you'd be surprised like a lot of my friends I, I met them because they were a shop staff actually I would go to stores and they would see me and you know we'd make like you know just whatever like conversation and eventually you know you make friends that way I mean just go out of your house and don't be afraid to talk to people even if your Japanese is like not super great or whatever I mean even if you're shy eventually you'll start to gain more confidence eventually you'll talk to people more and eventually you'll start making friends so leave your house it's the best thing you can do you might want to know like what is what a typical day at language school would be so an average day um, at language school I wake up uh, I leave my apartment I get on one train and then I transfer to another train because everyone takes a train here the train or the metro or, or, or bikes but nobody really drives in Tokyo, so you will take the train. It was like three hours worth of class, either in the morning or in the afternoon. So most of my classes um, were in the morning, actually. Which was really great, because then um, eventually I was able to get in a, a job for the afternoon. I would work some afternoons. We had a lot of tests, so like once you're in like higher levels, you'd actually have exams every day. So there was a lot of studying that had to be done. Again, there was also a lot of time that you could work a part-time job. Now a lot of you guys have been asking me about working while you're a student. Can you do it? Can you not do it? The answer is yes and no actually. Um, if you have a student visa, that is not a working permit at all. So in order to be able to work, you have to actually apply for um, a working permit. So it's not automatic with your, your student visa. And you can probably be denied a working permit as well. If you apply for it, you will probably get it. That also takes a little while to get maybe about a month or so before you can actually start using it. Once you start language school or wherever, whatever school you want to go to, there will be people who work there who know these things and you can talk to them to know more about how to apply for these things. The important thing to know is that your student visa does not equal a working permit. They're two separate things. You're allowed to work up to 28 hours a week and obviously nothing that is like like most bars are not allowed, um, anything kind of sketchy is not allowed, obviously. It'll probably be explained to you by um, the people who go to, who work at your school, because they don't want you to get into any trouble. But it's important to know that you will make some money, but you're not going to be making that much money. You're not going to be able to make enough money to pay for your tuition, your rent, your living expenses, food and all that on just a part-time job of 28 hours max a week. You have to have saved enough ahead of time. So just keep that in mind. It acts as a good supplement. So you should remember that things don't always turn out the way you think that they might turn out. Like when I moved here, it was again January 2011. And then two months later was the big earthquake in Tohoku. I mean, we were lucky in Tokyo that it wasn't too horrible. It was, I mean, it was a really scary moment. It could have been obviously far worse. I mean, I had just moved here, right? And most of my friends that I had made were foreign at this point in time. After the earthquake, most uh, foreigners moved back home or at least left Japan for a while. So all the friends I had just made kind of all disappeared. And um, luckily my, my family was really supportive. And so they supported my decision to stay in Japan. But um, it, was, it, was, it was obviously really lonely because everyone had, had left. And it was a really scary period of time. Um, there were still a lot of earthquakes. Uh, for a really long time, like larger ones that we have than we have now. Because of that, I mean, it, it sounds bad, but because of that, it changed the way that I saw a lot of things. And had it not been for that, I mean, I probably wouldn't be here now. Because originally, I was only going to be here for a few months. I wasn't like the plan wasn't for me to be in Japan indefinitely. It it was for like three semesters or something like that. But once the earthquake happened, I realized there's no way I can really just go home after that. Instead of cutting my, my stay shorter, actually, I extended my stay an extra couple of semesters and I, I really wanted to make sure I stayed in Japan. What's really important to know is that when you're living in another country, anything can happen and you have to be able to uh, adapt to different situations. I mean, like, I've been here for over three years now, so I've known enough people who haven't had a good, who haven't been able to adapt well to living here. Um, who realized that it wasn't what they expected it to be. And I mean, even, this is a little bit um, different timeline now, but even once I started at Bunka, for example, um, a lot of people drop out. 
And I'm not talking about foreign students. I mean, even Japanese students, mainly Japanese students actually, um, drop out during their first year. Anytime you're in a new environment, a new situation, you have to try and find a way of adapting. Because really, anything can happen. And the further you are from home, the, f the harder it is for you to just go back home. Another thing you have to kind of realize when you move to a new country is that depending on how far it is from where your, 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 your home is, you might not be able to go home very often. Now in my case, I mean, I don't really get homesick very often, so uh, it's not really uh, a big issue, but um, if you really are used to a certain way of life and certain comforts from home, you might not have them here. You probably won't have them here actually. And you have to find ways of either dealing with it or finding ways of like bringing stuff with you to make you feel a bit better about things. But I mean, you, it's all about coping actually. Coping and finding alternatives and just trying to stay positive and um, just trying to get through whatever life throws your way. One of the most important things I learned in my first year in Japan is really to adapt to whatever comes my way. All of my, fr my, my foreign friends who have done well in Japan, again, they all are the kinds of people who can adapt to whatever happens, who stay positive and who find ways of coping with any sort of like problem that happens. So, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to remember that um, your expectations are not going to be reality in any way, shape, or form. For good or for bad, I mean, it's not all negative. Some things turn out way better than you expect, and some things don't. For example, for myself, I didn't think I was going to go to fashion school when I came to Japan. Um, that was just something that happened when I was here, and I realized, you know, this is something that can give me something else. This is something that maybe I was looking for this whole time. So um, I adapted to the fact that I was like, not sure where I was going and not sure what to do and then all of a sudden I kind of saw this opportunity and I thought hey you know let's try it let's see what happens anything can happen maybe you'll find the job that you never thought you wanted to do or you meet somebody who kind of changes everything I'm kind of lucky because my parents send me care packages with homemade cookies sometimes and like other things that I can't get in Japan the longer you stay here actually kind of the, the less you need people to send you essentials from home because you find other things in Japan that you can't get back home that kind of, I don't want to say take the place because they don't, but they kind of act as something else that makes Japan more, more fun to be in. I mean, maybe it's a favorite food of yours or like, I don't know, I could, I don't know, it could be anything really. Just something that you can only get in Japan that you really enjoy that kind of makes you feel more at home here. And I mean, like the longer you stay here, the more you, you'll start to fit in, the, the less you'll, you'll miss things back home. But at the end of the day, it's important to know that you'll never fit in 100%, you'll never become Japanese. Um, and it's, it's a hard thing to be told, actually. It's something that you have to really experience to understand. But I mean, it's not necessarily a negative thing. It's just that you have to understand that you're different. And it's not like people are gonna treat you badly because of that. It's, it's just the way things are at the end of the day. It's just life. You'll find your little niche. You'll find your friends. Don't worry about it. That was just a brief overview of uh, my first year in Japan. But if you have any more questions about more specific things, let me know in the comments or on uh, Twitter, Instagram or anything. So my next episode, I'll be talking to you guys about finishing up at language school and then starting off at Bunka. So this series is supposed to be about my adventures at Bunka Fashion College. And we haven't actually gotten to that yet, but um, I promise it's on its way and I'll be talking about it more next time. Thanks again for all of your really nice comments and for following me on Instagram and Twitter and, and Tumblr and everything. Thank you and see you next time. Bye bye. Oh, my classmates. Hi, my name is Christina. Oh,